Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Um, that is um, Matthew 28, 16 through 20, the Great Commission of, of Jesus. And, and um, as I was looking at songs after, after Easter and thinking about what it maybe would have been like back in biblical times, after you find out that um, Jesus is alive, the party doesn't end. Um, he's still here or there at that time. He, he was um, on earth for approximately 40 days and uh, lots of different people <coughs> saw him. And so I was trying to put myself <clears throat> into what kind of emotions I would be having had I been back there at that time. And um, you know, would, I, would I believe it without seeing him? Would I just, just believe what somebody told me? Would I just fall down on my knees and say, it's all true, what, what he did, what he said would happen, it's all true. Um, I think that I would have had a lot of reverence for him. Um, I would have had a lot of fear, and I think I would have just been, um, my mind would have been blown, I guess, in today's terms. Um, awestruck, there would have been wonder, there would have been a big sense of unworthiness, thinking that Jesus is alive and he suffered and did all of this for me. And so when I was trying to find uh, songs for today, I wanted to have those emotions come through in the songs and, and what, we, what we're doing. And so the first song is Crown Him in Majesty because I had just a, an overwhelming feeling of reverence, like he is king of kings, lords of lords, and um, just a feeling of, of awe. And, and uh, then we have um, the Revelation song where, where you're just wondering about all of the things that he can do and will do and has done. And then we go into holy, 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 and just how, um, how great he is and singing that. So, um, and then the last songs too, Here I Am to Worship, that is what we're here to do, is to worship him, to give him praise and glory forever and ever. And then going into I Surrender All, because what it really comes down to is we are surrendering, surrendering our life to him, and we're giving it all to him. And I just think that if, if it had been me back in uh, biblical times, I'd have been on a roller coaster. I'd have been high, then I'd have been low, then I'd have been scared, and then I would have been gung-ho, and then I would have been hiding in a closet probably. So I, I just, um, and I know that's probably a woman thing, that there's a lot of emotions that women can have. Guys are probably like, yeah, there he is. Mm. And, um, but women kind of have, wear the emotions on the sleeve. So, that's what was going through my mind when um, I was choosing these songs for this service because we're a week after Easter and we're still celebrating that he's alive.
invite you guys to stand again with us as we continue to worship. Um, this next song is Here I Am to Worship.
This is the first Sunday after Resurrection Sunday, and uh, I, I appreciated the video there. Did you think that was kind of cute there? Yeah, we just want to hang Jesus back up on the cross and, and um, weep and cry and talk about how bad it was, but Jesus, the whole reason Jesus went to the cross was for our sins, and yeah. And he's not there anymore. He rose from the grave. Um, so what is, you know, what, what, what are we supposed to be doing now, now that uh, Jesus is risen from the grave? What's, what, what's our role in all of this? And it brings us to the fact that the disciples, first of all, had a very hard time grasping the idea that Jesus had risen from the grave. And then what were they to do? Um, at first, we know that Peter decided uh, with the disciples that they were going to go fishing at some point in time after Jesus um, rose from the grave. And so um, there's this, you know, 40-day window from the resurrection until the ascension that, um, that we have uh, accounts of Jesus seeing the disciples in different circumstances, different situations. And at that time, he gave them the marching orders. He said, this is, this is what it's all about. This is why I did what I did and what I've been teaching you, what I've been teaching you so that you can go out and make disciples and proclaim the gospel so that others might know of the forgiveness of God and the love of God. So that's called the Great Commission. So that's what we're going to uh, be looking at this morning, Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 to 20, and the idea is to go and, and make disciples with the confidence that God is with us, right? Go and make disciples with the confidence that God is with us. Now, it's kind of hard to um, preach on the Great Commission because everybody knows the Great Commission. Everybody can quote it to me back. You can memorize the verses. The question is, are we doing it, All right? It's one thing to have it here. It's another thing to have it here and to have it here, right? So uh, let's look at this passage here and let's uh, be well informed and hopefully be clear as to what the Holy Spirit wants us to do with the teaching that we receive today. So in this account here in Matthew chapter 28, we're not exactly sure uh, when it occurs. We know it occurs sometimes after the resurrection, obviously, and sometimes before or sometime before the ascension. And so Jesus appears to his disciples. And as he does this, um, we find out that Jesus has appeared to his disciples at about 10 different times after the resurrection. Now, different situation, different circumstances, but about 10 different times. And, and it's interesting that God would do that, that Jesus would appear to us like that, or appeared to his disciples that way. I mean, after all, he spent three years with them. They saw him crucified on the cross. They see him risen from the grave. Well, why 10 times? Why, why not just once? Or why not 100 times? Okay? I don't know why not 100 times. I know why not once. And that is because the disciples needed to be encouraged. They had, been, uh, they had a hard time grasping this. They had a hard time believing this. Uh, even though Jesus had talked about his uh, impending crucifixion, his impending death, and um, uh, that he would rise again, they just couldn't grasp it as he was alive. And even after he rose from the grave, they still couldn't quite grasp it that quickly. But uh, we're told here, um, here in the Great Commission that in uh, coming before them, he wanted to encourage them with the knowledge that uh, he has authority and that that authority is being bestowed upon them to go out in the name of Jesus and to proclaim the message of hope, the message of good news, the gospel message, and to be reminded that uh, Jesus is with his disciples throughout the age, throughout the church age here. The first point here as we look at it is that Jesus has authority over all creation. Jesus has authority over all creation. Um, as we read here in uh, verses, ah, I went too fast, and I will go back. 16 to 18, it says this, 
Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. So you notice that, first of all, that there are 11 disciples. There's not 12 disciples. If you remember, G Judas uh, went out and, and hung himself there and, and as he, after he betrayed Jesus. And so you're working with 11 disciples. You don't have a 12th disciple because they didn't uh, take the casting of lots and take the vote and vote in Matthias yet. You get that in Acts chapter uh, 1, and they take up, choose uh, this disciple because they think they need to have somebody to, um, to fill in for Judas. Uh, twelve seems to be a good number. There are twelve tribes of Israel, right? So why not have one disciple, a representative of those? And, um, but there's not anything magic in the number that I know of. Okay? Um, with uh, the eleven disciples, sometimes people think, well, you know, God's 12th disciple was supposed to be the Apostle Paul. And so this was man's idea of doing this when they uh, voted to get this guy, Matthias, uh, to come in and to be this disciple to replace Judas. Uh, I don't think it's, I don't know if that's entirely accurate because it does talk about Matthias later on in the book of Acts. I mean, it just talks about the 12, the 12, the 12, the 12, the 12. After that, and it's, he's in reference, he's being referenced in that group of 12. And it seems like God gives uh, him all the, um, all the uh, props, if you will, uh, the respect of, of the other uh, disciples, even, even with having the Apostle Paul come on and, and be this, uh, this uh, particular apostle, if you will. So you have the 11 disciples, and it says they went to Galilee. They went to a mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And so this is an account of them being back up there in the Galilee area. If you remember, Jesus first appears to them in the Jerusalem area right after um, he was crucified. And so this is some time after that fact, after they uh, spent the time in Jerusalem, they head back to their, um, to their towns, to their villages, to be where they're... Um, where they live, and Jesus appears to these disciples there in Galilee. It says, to a mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And so we had talked about this last week in Matthew chapter 28, where Jesus talked about um, the disciples going to Galilee. And in Matthew chapter 26, he had told his disciples, when I come again, when I rise, I'll meet you there in Galilee. So this is just fulfilling what he had already said. Here is somebody who has been directing the affairs of all creation, if you will, has the foreknowledge of all that's taking place and understands all the circumstances as he had been presenting to his disciples all along. I mean, even as they prepared uh, for the Passover meal, he told them when they go into town, they would find this, this, this donkey and a colt and tied up there. And if somebody asked you, this is what you say. So Jesus is exhibiting and displaying all of this this, this wisdom, if you will, this knowledge there. And he's, he's, uh, he's done that with the disciples throughout his whole time of being with them. And so here he gives them this direction there. He had given them the direction to go to this mountain. We don't know exactly which mountain it is, uh, but he goes to a mountain in Galilee and that's where he appears to them. And when you think about him going to a mountain, um, if you think about... Uh, the way the scriptures and the way revelation is, the mountain is a place where God usually reveals some new truth, something new about what he's doing, and some, or, or something new to us about what he's doing. You can get this in the book of Exodus at Mount Sinai. God gives Moses the law there. Uh, you get this in Jesus' first sermon that we have recorded is the Sermon on the Mount. And so it's a mountainside, and he's giving all this new direction, this new teaching, this new authority. We know the mountain of transfiguration. You have you know, James, Peter, James, and John there, and they get to see Jesus in his glory, you know? And so this idea of being on the mountaintop is a place where, where we think, you know, it seems to indicate through the scriptures that this is a place where revelation is given. So Jesus, in directing his disciples there, was going to give them some, some new revelation, some new understanding about uh, what he's been doing all along and who he is and what he wants for his disciples. And so 
uh, we, we see this, and as Jesus appears to them, um, it says they saw him, they worshiped him. Didn't say that he all of a sudden came walking up the mountainside, didn't say where he came from, just said he appears to them where he's there, and they saw him, and the response is they worshiped him, and Renee was talking about that. We, we, we saw that last week with Mary Magdalene there just falling down and grabbing the feet of Jesus, and so, <clears throat> and so we see this idea of worship, that there's a proper response to see uh, in seeing Jesus, is that that's what they do. They recognize him for who he is, and somehow or another, they know that this is the right response, is to, is to worship him. When you're talking about worship, we're talking about this position of prostration before Jesus, lying down before him. That's that word there uh, that we get worship from, the word proskuneo. And so um, it says that as they saw him, they worshiped him, but it says, but some doubt it. Hey. Um, and so you think, well, if seeing is believing, then why would anyone doubt? Okay. And I'll tell you why. Because seeing is not believing. You can see and still not believe as we already have seen what's, what's taking place here with the, the disciples. They see, they can't believe it. They're doubting. The idea that they're doubting is they're wavering. They're wavering in whether or not this is really what they think it is. This is really an appearance of Jesus after he was crucified and laid in a tomb. And so sometimes we can doubt as well. We waver sometimes. I'm not suggesting that we do that. I just think that sometimes it is hard to accept the things that we know are already true. Intellectually, we can get them. We can read them in the scriptures. We could have heard them preach. We could hear them in a lesson. We can know these things are true. But, but being able to get our life in conformity with that truth sometimes is, is, is a struggle for us. And so we waver sometimes in that. And I think, like I said before, uh, God understands that. I think that's probably why Jesus appeared to his disciples on 10 different occasions, so that any wavering, any doubting that was taking place would, would be replaced with the confidence to know that Jesus is alive. He is risen from the grave. And so... Um, we see that some doubted, and as Jesus appears to them, what does he say? It says, Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So as he comes into their presence and, and, and talks to them, the first thing he says is he declares his authority to them. He says that all authority in heaven and on earth, and heaven and earth is, is, the, is the summation, the the way of, of declaring creation that, you know, God is the creator of the heavens and the earth. It's the idea that uh, Jesus is, has all authority in heaven and on earth. And it, you could even put that in there to think, okay, even heaven, right, and on earth. So it's all of creation. It's all of the universe. And he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And so there's this idea that, what am I Am I scrubbing something? Is this? Put it down. Okay, thank you. And, and so uh, this idea, it's a, there's a passive side to this. Jesus says that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. I didn't take it for myself. It's the idea that even though it's due him, there's still this understanding that he submits himself to the person of the Father and, and what God's big plan is in all of this. And so he says that all authority in heaven and earth has been given me. And this is, echoes back to some of the, the talks that Jesus had with his disciples and with the Pharisees. And he talked about this son of man and the authority he would have. And, and it echoes back to Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 through 14. Uh, Daniel writes, I saw in the night vision and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. In his kingdom, one that shall not be destroyed. So Jesus echoes back to this son of man, this, 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 this uh, person referred to in Daniel chapter 7. And he says that he has the authority and so sometimes we wonder whether Jesus is really in charge. 
We look in the world and we say, hey, there's evil in the world and it's rampant and it's crazy. Like, and where is God in all this? Is he, is he in charge? Well, God has a plan to rid the world of evil and it's all part of him establishing his kingdom, his eternal kingdom, and his subjects, his servants, his people are those who pr- proclaim the good news of the kingdom in this world to bring others into that kingdom, to present the gospel, the good news, so that others might know the Savior. So this is God's plan. Sometimes we, we, we wonder whether or not Jesus is really in charge, if he really has all that authority, because we fail for ourselves to see the dramatic changes in our lives with the things that we struggle with. We say, well, God, if you're so powerful, then why am I so weak in all these areas? And if you told me you would be with me and you give me your spirit, why can I not overcome these sorts of things. And, and sometimes the changes are not dramatic, they're subtle. You know, I, 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 we talked about this before, you know, if I, if I look in the mirror and I see myself, I, I, I've never changed, you know? I look exactly the way I do every day, right? Is that right? But if you look back in a picture of you 30 years ago, you know you've changed, Correct? And I'm not saying it's all bad. I'm just saying it's what it is. And so there is change that goes on. When we don't see little kids for a period of time, all of a sudden, especially little kids, and you see them grow from a year to another year. I mean, Cheryl was gone on vacation, and she comes back, and little babies that were being held are now walking around here in the church, right? Yes, you mentioned that. And it's like that. There's that growth. Sometimes it doesn't seem dramatic to us, and sometimes it's not. But God is at work in our lives. And you know what the thing is? When we think about why is it not more dramatic, well, sometimes it's because we're resistant to what God is doing. Sometimes we don't want to let go. We want to be who we are. The world tells you to be who you are. Don't change for anybody. Right? But... God wants us to conform us to the image of Jesus Christ. That means there's going to be some change in there. And so we need, to, we need to understand that. So sometimes we don't see the dramatic changes there because we might be resisting what it is that, that God is doing. And so as Jesus comes to his disciples and he tells them, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, he says, now that you know that, now that you understand that, here's the facts of the matter. This is what I want you to do. He says in verse 19, to go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. And so um, we're uh, we're to understand that Jesus has chosen us to be his imperfect messengers. I put perfect up there because the fact that we're imperfect makes us perfect for what Jesus wants to do. Remember, his strength is made perfect in our weakness And so if we think that we're doing things in our own strength, then where is God getting the glory in all that? So he specializes in using imperfect people, but that makes us the perfect people to be his messengers. You follow me with that? Not too hard, right? And so uh, as we're seeing that, you know, all authority in in heaven and earth is, is given to Jesus and he bestows that upon His disciples, i.e., that is us, we're the disciples of the disciples of the disciples of the disciples, we're Jesus' disciples, that we're to be be confident in all of that. And now he says, go therefore and make disciples, because Jesus Jesus has chosen us as his imperfect messengers, he wants us to be confident, okay? Uh, or, Or committed, I should say. He wants us to be committed. The last point will be something about being confident. He wants us to be committed. So go, therefore, and make uh, disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. So the idea of a disciple is somebody who is to be about the disciple-making business, just like Jesus. Uh, Go and make disciples of all nations. And so he gives us this this command to go. And the idea of... uh, of going is not the idea that you're just out kind of on a little leisurely tour there. It's the idea that you're going out with some intention and what you do. On a daily basis, we're to be going out with the things of God in mind. Whatever it is that we have to do, whatever work we have to do, whatever projects we're working on, whatever it is, 
God is in all of that. If we are following after God, he's leading us into all of these sorts of things there. His desire is to be with us and to help us to, 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 to walk with him as we're, we're doing his work. So this idea of going out is to go out with some sort of intention there. To, the intention is to be about the work of God. The command in this verse here is to make disciples. Okay, the going, it takes the, takes the aspect of the command to make disciples, and that's where you get the go side of it, okay? So, when we make disciples, we're to go and to make disciples, and it says of all nations. Uh, so, that's, that's, that's everybody, okay? That includes everybody. Um, and it says here, to baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, so we know that the disciples are those who follow after Jesus. Jesus commands his disciples to be baptized. Okay? It's not a baptism for salvation. It's a baptism of obedience. John had baptized disciples. That was a baptism of repentance. When we come and we come to know the Lord Jesus Christ and we're baptized, we're baptized into an obedience. We're saying, I want to follow you, Jesus. This is what you have commanded of your disciples. This is what I do. And so it says, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That's one name there. You can go and look that up in the, in the original language. It's just one name, the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. It's the name of the triune God. And so sometimes when people ask about the Trinity and how we, we don't quite understand everything about it, but we do know that God has, we, all, we, we are also aware of what God has revealed to us. And so some things we do have to accept without really any understanding. That is actually the essence of faith. And so here it is. We have this being baptized in the name of the triune God, the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. And it says to teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. So there's, there's this idea or observe, my, my version says, but the, the word in there is to, to keep, to, to keep these things that are being taught. So teaching them to keep all that I have commanded you is not just to keep in your minds. It's not just to keep in your Bibles. It's not just to keep in your notebooks. It's to keep in that you are obedient in your life to what God is teaching us, what he's telling us to do, the things that we're learning. And so we must know the teaching in order to grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. So saying all of that, where do we get our teaching from? Well, sometimes people, there's so much available now, right? You can go online, you can go on the radio, you can watch it on TV. But most everybody, first of all, they'll get it in Sunday. They'll get it in the Sunday service. They're going to get some teaching there. You'll get some teaching here as we worship together. Part of worship also is seeing God for who he is and understanding what he wants us to do with that or being obedient to what he's calling us to do. Secondly, you'll get it in your Sunday school class, Okay. Your, our Bible classes, you're going to get that. You're going to get some teaching in there. You're going to get some teaching in small groups. You're going to get some teaching in your quiet times. Uh, and, and, and all that sort of stuff is good. You'll get that, that all this teaching there. And sometimes people think, well, that's too much teaching. I have so much teaching, I can't handle it. I think the thing is, the problem is, is that, you know, we, we think that it's too much teaching. And sometimes I feel like that for myself. But the truth is, I need all of that and then some more. That's what I find out. You can survive on, 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 on Sunday worship and Sunday school class. You can survive like that. And many people do. You know, there's one thing to be hooked up to a life support system or to be existing and you say, I'm surviving, I'm alive. There's another thing to be living with vitality and strength and energy. That's, there's a difference there. So you can survive on the littlest necessary, but you're not going to thrive. And so this idea of learning and growing <clears throat> and, and teaching is part of the discipling process as well. We need to know what it is that God says so that we can be consistent in our obedience to it. We can get our lives in conformity uh, with that truth. And so uh, the, the idea of all of that knowledge does never replaces the idea that we have a daily personal walk with Jesus as well. 
So you need all of that. So whatever you're doing, there's this constant. It's not just that we reserve it for Sunday, Sunday service and Sunday, Sunday school, and then, oh, small group time in the middle of the week sometime, and then, okay, then I have my quiet times here, and then throughout the rest of the time, I'm just kind of doing it on my own. No, the idea is that Jesus is with us, and that's what he tells us here in verse 20. He says, I, I am with you always to the end of the age. He's with us in all that. And so we are in prayer. We don't know what decisions to make. Even though we have wisdom and we have knowledge, there's still things that we got to deal with. Uh, when you're working on projects, you know, it's important to pray. Not just so that God will bless your projects, but that so you can have the insight of God as you're doing what you're doing and be able to handle what you're doing and do it in a way that's honoring to him. So we, we need that daily interaction as well. The disciples got to be willing. It says, teaching to observe all that I have commanded you. The willingness to obey. It doesn't make somebody a disciple just because they have a bunch of knowledge in their head. You can replace the knowledge. You can get that knowledge. You can do that in a short period of time. You can attend a Bible college, and it can cram knowledge into you. You can get the knowledge of some people would get in 20 years, in three years. All right? But the thing is, you're not going to get the experience that comes with that knowledge. That's the base. That's the foundation. I know. I've been to seminary. I know what it's about. Okay? You can get the knowledge there. What do you do with that? How do you, how do you deal with the 40, 50, 60 years of experience that you see other people have who never had the experience of seminary or Bible college? They've walked with the Lord. And so as disciples, that's what it's about. It's not just about a bunch of head knowledge. It is about walking with the Lord. But I don't think you do that well unless you know what you're doing. And I think that's why it's important to have the knowledge. I think that's what God wants us to know too. I think we need more, not less, okay? And my wife can feed me the bare minimum, but I like it when I have a good meal too, okay? It gives me more strength for what I need, okay? Otherwise, I'll go out and start buying candy bars at the store. And that's not gonna work for me in the long run. I know that. And I eat lots of chocolate, okay? So the idea here of the disciple is he must be willing to obey. He, he, he got to be in touch with Jesus to keep on the, the, the idea of the knowledge and all that sort of stuff it is, is for us to grow. The idea of going out to all nations is this idea of, of create or going to the mission field, if you will. And make no mistake about it, Jesus did not make a distinction between home missions and foreign missions. Okay? He said all nations there, but he said, go wherever you are and you're making disciples. All along the way, wherever Jesus was, he made disciples. And so this idea of going and moving with purpose, <clears throat> there's not a distinction here in, in, in the mind of God between where these disciples are made, just the idea that we go out with this, with this intention. We go out there with the idea of doing the work of God. And finally, so as we're looking at Jesus has chosen us as his imperfect messengers, and we looked at that, now the idea is that Jesus promises to be with us as we go and make disciples. This is uh, verse 20, verse B, and so we're to be comforted with this knowledge. The, the knowledge is important because sometimes we don't know, we don't feel. It just as we're, we sing songs there, and they talk about making us feel, let us feel your presence. We need to feel God's presence. Jesus reminds us that we're, he's with us. And sometimes you will go through things and you won't feel his presence. That's what that whole little poem about footsteps is about, right? It's that we going through hardships can be very certain that God is not with us. And we feel like that. By the same token, when things are going really great, we can be very confident that God is with us. And so we know that. But it doesn't matter what the set of circumstances are. Jesus says, as his disciples, he says, I am with you always to the very end of the age. You, you see the, 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 the emphasis there? Behold, I am with you always to the end. Some say uh, to the very end of the age. Some say at the beginning, say, surely I am with you always to the very end of the age, I think is what the NIV reads. It's this idea, there's a kind of a triple encouragement there to remind us that he's with us. Why? Because we need to know that. We need to be reminded of that. 
Uh, this is something that happened with the, the prophets. We know that Moses said, I won't go and do what you're, gonna, what you're asking me to do unless you go with me. And God says, I'm going with you. Jeremiah had the same problem. Ezekiel had the same problem. God had to remind them that he's with them. Because why? It feels lonely. Sometimes it doesn't feel like God is with you. But he is. And so we're being reminded of this. It says to the very end of the, uh, of the age there. So there, there's a, what age are we talking about? We're talking about this age of the church. It's the opportunity for us to be able to get the message out, to go and make disciples. We don't get to make disciples in heaven. There's no evangelism taking place there as we think about it here. Right? So we have this time to do it. This is what God has given to us. And he reminds us that as we go and do it, he's with us to the very end of the age. So I wanted to spend this time with us because we can be like those people at the cross there who are just looking at things and kind of saying, oh, yes, you know, Jesus, thank you for dying for my sins. And we got a hammer and we want to nail him back up to the cross, you know. And it was kind of cute to see, but we miss out on what he's given us. He's given us, the, given us salvation. He's given us eternal life. He's given us himself so that we can continue on with the mission. Jesus never lost sight of that, no matter what was going on. He wanted to proclaim the kingdom of God, and that's what he did. As we are faithful in following the great commission of Jesus Christ to go and make disciples, Let's go out into all the world confident that we are backed by the full power and authority of Jesus Christ himself. We're back to carry out his mission. Let us be committed as his disciples. Let's make disciples of anyone we can. And let's begin by sharing the life-changing message of the gospel with them. That life-changing message has changed our lives, and so that's how we start off. Amen? Let's not be distressed about whether God is with us or not. Let's be comforted in knowing that the promise of Emmanuel, God with us, which is actually how this book starts out, if you think about it, in Matthew chapter 1, 23, it's, just, it's a story, it's the prophecy of Emmanuel, God with us, and then at the very end, Jesus says, I am with you always. So it's this promise of Emmanuel, let that be uh, something that comforts us as, as we, and, and it's an ongoing reality um, no matter what the circumstances, because he reminds us that he's with us to the very end of the age. Would you stand with us again as we sing our final song? As Pastor was saying, we can go with confidence and uh, sing, It Is Well With Our Soul.
May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Spirit be with you all now and always. Amen.